This is for um, a friend of mine, Shmuel. It says like this, um, in, in regarding um, the, uh, the belief that, that um, a historical man is Hashem himself, can be God himself, um, that this is engaging in some way in, in the Vadazar, which is foreign worship. Um, and he says, this is a long saying debate, what is your take? Um, I, I think it is, I think it is that a worship to say that God is a man in any way, um, or could be a man, because um, the Rambam says, Ein lo de musagufa, ein lo He doesn't have a body, nor does he have a semblance of a body. And one thing Judaism has been clear about since day one, is that there's no physical manifestation of God. That's why God is very clear, don't make statues, don't, don't, don't prostrate to idols. And he wants to clearly distinguish between man and God. And in my opinion, when you start praying to a man, or a, attributing a man uh, godly qualities, of course, if you say he's more perfect than you, or he's more righteous than you, he's a greater saint, he's a greater genius, okay, that's one thing. There is greater and lesser in the realm of the human being. But to put a man over you and to say that his connection to God is somehow higher than yours or that he's, uh, he's godly, outside of his soul, of course, which we all have a soul, but outside of that, I think it is foreign to what God had entitled when he took the Jews out of Egypt. And he said, you're not going to be slaves to power anymore, you're going to be slaves to me, to, to the invisible God. Um, and that's why you, you didn't see people in the desert, you know, bowing down to Moses. He was clearly the leader of the generation, the greatest prophet to ever live. It says in the Torah itself, Look, come be Israel, come Moshe, that in, in Israel never rose a prophet like Moses. It never happened such a thing. He's the greatest prophet of all time. That's why no later prophet can ever undo the will of Moses and the wisdom of Moses, as it's elucidated in the five books of Moses. Um, and then another question. Can you comment on Shituf, which you define as strange, make sure that it's creating a false partner with Hashem versus our own role in becoming genuine oivdim, laborers, and Shitufim, co-workers, co-working partners, with Hashem and Tikkun all I'm praying in the world. Yeah, so this was also something in idol worship that they would as they would assign powers to uh, different forces in nature and they would say that together, you know, God has other partners in creating the world and in operating the world and making the world, making the universe function according to the rules of nature which God established. But um, in Judaism we say no, there's one God and he's clearly in charge of everything and he's the sole creator. He's the sole emanator. From him emanates every single other thing. He doesn't need a partner, he doesn't have a partner. And many times in the measures especially, it says that God will, will um, take counsel with supernal uh, like, uh, advisors, as it were. But this doesn't mean that they create, or they help create, or they, uh, anything manifests from them. He's the only one. He's the supreme being. He's the, this is what monotheism really is, belief in one God. And this God is above every other, other thing in creation, because he creates them all. Everything emanates from him. He's the, the first causation, as we would say. Um, when, and the Jewish concept is very nice, and I'm glad you, you brought it up, is that we're partners in creation with God. This was a big um, word you heard a lot from the from the from Lubavitcher Rebbe, that he said that we are partners in creation with God. That God made the world, but he didn't make it perfect. He made it for us to perfect it. And how do we perfect it? With our good deeds uh, towards each other, acting as true brothers should, and also observing the, the commandments that God gave us that are, that are relevant only between man and God. But it's in this way that we become partners with God and that we can, we can repair the world from its current state of uh, darkness and, and crime and war and poverty. And I mean, all these things were not really in the uh, grain of creation. If you take a look, we, we, we're not lacking anything. Yet still we choose to enslave ourselves in societies where some people have more and some people have less and some nations uh, are now they're like small groups go to war with nations and we don't address these things on any real level and say so we just sit around and in America they have this new thing where they're just gonna print more money they already owe 11.2 trillion dollars to different <laughs> uh, institutions I would imagine banks and maybe foreign governments I'm not sure probably banks and, uh, and, and before this president came to office, they were spending 400, I think, uh, $45 billion more than they actually made for themselves. So you can imagine any business going to a, a bank to get another one on top of this debt. Imagine what, the, what the, this deficit, imagine what that end deficit, imagine what the bank would tell them. Sorry, it's not a good investment. Please pay back what you can. We're cutting you off and that's it. The president and his wisdom has decided Let's just print more money that further devalues our, our currency. 
And instead of spending 445 or 450 billion dollars I don't have, I'm going to spend close to 2 trillion dollars or 1.2 trillion dollars. I'm not sure if they got the final number of how much they want to spend money they don't have. There's no real acknowledgement. This is a little off topic, but there's no real acknowledgement. I'll take an olam, let's say. There's, there's stopped being at some point in our government an acknowledgement that there is a next generation. And at some point, we're going to be the ones, not me, you know, or me, but people my age and younger, we have to sit down and look at numbers that don't even make sense to anyone. We're going to be owing, what, $15 trillion soon? $20 trillion. And we're just going to be looking around wondering why our government is so vastly ineffective. We can't afford to pay our workers. We can't afford to pay benefits. We can't afford anything. Because, uh, and this really started in the days of Reagan. Let, let the Republicans not be shy about this fact. When he got in, he was the first person to put a, a debt of a, of a trillion dollars. These are numbers which you really can't fathom. People talk about billionaires you can't fathom. A millionaire is hard to fathom. You're talking about a trillion dollars. And everything was great in the 80s. People loved it, the me generation. And you look around, why is it so great? We're spending money we didn't have. This only got worse and worse and worse. President Bush did a very good job also. Of course, he'll blame the war. And maybe he's rightfully so. I've really run a country in a time of war. I can't imagine how difficult that must be. But um, I think he got it up to, uh, to trend. I think he doubled it from five to ten trillion. It was really, really. Uh, of course, we only had one attack on our soil, thank God. So how, how can you put a value in human life? But um, now the new president is just continuing in the generation of, in, in the with the uh, with the with the intellectual approach of printing money that's worth nothing, spending money that's grossly devalued and hoping that this is going to put a band-aid on the cancer. Maybe the cancer will go away. The truth is there's a business cycle, and um, I'm getting way off topic. Anyway, so, um, so in, t in terms of Tikkun Olam, the, the, the economy, the, the, the lesson is always you know, living within your means and, and um, operating within that which you can afford. And I'm just surprised that there's still people giving out credit cards to a generation that has shown clearly they can't handle credit. And still people getting mortgages to a generation that's shown clearly we can't ha handle mortgages. But um, if you want to fix the world, you obviously you start with your own little ballot omelets, your own little four cubits. Make sure everything's okay where you are and with what you're doing. And hopefully this will resonate to other people in your community and with your community to other communities. And to them, to, to the entire state which you live. And then to uh, the other states, the surrounding states, and then the whole country, from this country to other countries. And you'll see you do have a, an, a powerful potential to affect the world positively with every single thing you do. And it's sorts of little things like just sharing a nice word, giving a compliment, trying to be more in a good mood so your good mood uh, affects other people. There's little things that can make our reality much more pleasant. And this is real uh, giving charity. This is real Tikkun Olam. This is real fixing the world, making this world as pleasant as possible. And uh, by focusing on, on the emotion of happiness for as long as possible and thinking about how to achieve this state of mind for a prolonged period of time. Thank you so much, my friend, Shmuel, and uh, may God bless you in everything that you do.